Normally when I come in, it starts recording right away. So I always have to pause it, <laughs> but I went ahead and started it again. So in the last class, we stopped with example two. And so far, all of the examples that we were doing in 5.2 had always led us to a unique solution where you had, um, you found some X value and some Y value, and that was your unique solution, right? It was that point where the two lines intersected each other, okay? However, there are cases where the two lines may never um, intersect. And so in that case, there would be no solution or where the two lines are actually just multiples of one another. Um, and in that case, they actually intersect everywhere on that line, right? Um, so there would be infinitely many solutions along that line. And those two cases, they haven't really surfaced yet as we're working out on the matrix, okay? So starting with example three, we should see one of these two different situations, okay? So as we work on the matrix, we will get to one of these two solutions for example three. And I'm guessing that example four is probably the other situation. I do wanna talk about both so that you can know how to identify whether the answer is no solution or infinitely many solutions. And I also wanna address, if the answer is infinitely many solutions, what do you type, right? What do you enter into the computer if you're saying that there's an infinite number of answers, okay? But not anything and everything is an answer, just the points on the line are the answers, okay? So we'll talk about how to represent that when we get to that example, okay? For now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna solve this system just like we did the ones on um, Tuesday. So the first thing we need to do is write this augmented matrix. And so then in this case, the coefficients of X would be just an invisible one and two. The coefficients of Y happen to be another positive one and positive two. And then my constants are on this side of the equal sign, right? So they're on the right side of the bar. And those are just two and five. So then my goal would be to first change this number to a one. However, we left out because it's already a one, right? So we don't need to do anything um, to make it turn into a one. It's good to go. So what I'm gonna do is basically skip step one and jump to step two which is to turn this one into a zero. And if we remember from the last class, I know it's been a while, but if we remember, you always have to use the same number that I circled, but with the opposite sign, okay? So you do negative two, and you're gonna multiply it by this row so that when you add it to that row, this is the row that's getting replaced with the new row, okay? So that that circle will turn to a zero. So let's go ahead and do this operation. So negative two times one is negative two, negative two times one again, same thing. And then negative two times two is negative four. Row two, I'm gonna put right underneath. And when I do this, I end up with zero, zero and a positive one, okay? So when I rewrite my matrix, Row two is the one getting replaced with this stuff down here, okay? So it's gonna become zero, zero with the bar, and then one. Row one is not changing. So that one's gonna stay exactly as it was, one, one, two, okay? Now the goal would be next is to turn this guy into a one. However, it's impossible to do that. Because in order for me to turn a number into a one, we're supposed to be multiplying by the reciprocal. But we talked about last class that zero is a whole number, which means it can be written as zero over one. And if you try to take the reciprocal of this, basically flip it over, it turns into one over zero. But this, does, this is not a, a number. This is an undefined expression. It's not a number, it's not a value, okay? Um, but because of that, I can't multiply by something that's undefined, okay? So then you can't turn this into a one. When that happens, when you get a zero here and you know you can't do the reciprocal, 
this is the point in which you need to stop, okay? As soon as you get those two zeros there, stop and see which case you have, okay? So this is saying there's no Xs, there's no Ys, there's nothing on this left-hand side of the equation. So there's literally nothing, zero on that side. But on this side, you have one, okay? So I'm just putting this back into its equation form. But if you look at that equation, that's actually what's called a contradiction, okay? It's an equation that just simply is not true, okay? Zero does not equal one, it does not. But it's telling you that it does, okay? So that's a contradiction. When you get a contradiction like this, um, that's when you'd say that the answer is no solution. So this contradiction is what tells us that the answer is no solution. Because it says zero equals one, but we know that zero is not equal to one. So that's this second case up here. So hopefully with the next example, hopefully we'll get one that looks like this because that one has a weird looking answer. So I'm gonna slide this up just a little bit. And example four will be our last example in, or no, I'm sorry. It's our last example that was given on these note pages, but I actually picked the word problem in the 5.2 homework because I wanted to talk about that word problem as well. So we do have two more that we'll talk about before I open the floor up for questions about the review. Okay, so I'm going to slide this up. If you did miss anything at the beginning, remember you can always watch the playback, right? The video. Um, and if you just wanted to look at what was written that you missed, I do post those notes as well. So you can get all the little bits that, you, that you're missing, okay? Um, if I try to do the same thing with example four, you first have to start with making the augmented matrix. Um, this one doesn't have any issues. You have your X's, you have your Y's, and all your constants are on this side. So you're ready to just give the augmented matrix. You don't have to write augmented matrix every single time. I'm just doing it so that you recognize the connection between augmented matrix and a system. So two and negative six for X, positive five, negative 15 for Y, and then negative seven and 21 for the constants. And so then our process starts just the same as the last one. Turn this one into a one first. And to do that, we use the reciprocal, right? So two is the same as two over one. So then the reciprocal is actually gonna be that fraction flipped over. So one over two. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take one over two times row one. And since I'm only manipulating row one, this will become my new row one. When you involve two rows though, you can only replace the one that's not getting multiplied by something. So I think we can do that. It's not really that big of a deal. We don't have to do any computations on the side. Nothing is happening to row two. So row two, I'm just gonna repeat. But then row one, I'm gonna multiply by one half. So two times one half, even if you use the calculator, we'll just say it's one. Five times one half, if you use the calculator, it will say it's five halves. 
and then negative seven times one half is negative seven halves. I have fractions now, but no big deal, mission accomplished. I have the one where I wanted it. Now the next step would be to turn this guy into a zero. Remember, you have to go in that U-shape order, okay? So this one has to be a, z a one, a zero, a one, and a zero. You have to do it in that order. Well, in order to turn things to a zero, you have to use the same number, but opposite sign. So six times. And I don't wanna multiply it by row two because that's the row that I need to change, right? So that I can have the zero. So you're gonna multiply that six times row one and then just add row two so that this one will be the new row with the zero where it belongs. So let's see, one times six, five halves times six is actually 15 and negative seven halves times six is negative 21. And if I put row two underneath, and I add these two things together, what I end up getting is zero, zero, and zero. And so that's going to be my row two. And row one will stay just the way it was. But now we see that we have that second situation, right? If I put this paper right here, we have this situation happening, okay? We got double zeros, so we know we need to stop, okay? As soon as you get those double zeros, you must stop. And then what you do is you just put this into its equation form. And this time I have zero on the left-hand side, the bar is the equal, and then I have zero on the other side. And this one is not a contradiction because zero does equal zero, right? This one is a true statement. When you get a true statement where zero does actually equal zero, then that tells you that there are infinitely many solutions. Okay, but how do we write the answer? What does it want, okay? It depends on what the computer tells you. If it just gives you, you know, coordinates like this and that's all they ask you for, they don't tell you what to do, then the first coordinate will always be X. And then this one, you have to write something in terms of X. So basically, if you can solve for Y, whatever you have on this side would go in there for Y. But sometimes they might tell you to like, let X equal A, some arbitrary random number. They might say, let X equal A. And then if you do that, you have to go figure out still what Y would look like. And then your X value would be A and your Y value would be whatever you found from the equation, okay? In both of these situations, regardless if you're gonna let X equal something random or you are or you're not, you still have to grab one of those equations from the very beginning and get Y all by itself, okay? So any of the equations from the beginning. I suggest if you have options, and we do, we have two options, right? Always grab the equation that has a positive Y if there is one, okay? And if there's an equation that doesn't even have a number in front, then I would do that one as well. Okay, that would be my priority. Just because it's easier to solve for Y. But I'm gonna take the top one just because it's positive and I'm going to try to solve for Y. When I do that, I have to get rid of this term first. So I'm gonna minus two X on both sides and I get this positive five Y by itself. And these are not like terms. This is a constant and this is a variable term. They're not the same variables. This one doesn't even have variables. So they are not like terms. You cannot put them together and say it's negative nine X. That is wrong, okay? 
all you can do is write the x term first and then the constant. And it just stays exactly like that. And then to continue solving for y, I would have to divide every single term by five. So that y would be by itself and you'd have negative two fifths x minus seven fifths, okay? Now, if they never told me to let x equal something, then this expression right here is exactly what's gonna go in this side of the point, okay? So it'd just be negative two fifths x minus seven fifths, and then this would be my answer, okay? However, if the computer does say something weird, like let x equal a, then it's the same expression, but if x equals a, then what you're typing in is negative two fifths a minus seven fifths not a very big difference, okay? So if they never say let x equal something, then you just use x's. If they say let x equal a letter, then you use that letter instead of x, okay? But it's essentially the same thing. So there is this table down here. It's just a summary. You don't need to write it all down or I'm gonna post it later anyway. But it just tells me that there are three different cases that can happen, right? Your lines can intersect each other and you get one answer, whatever the X value is, comma, whatever the Y value is. Or two, the um, two lines can never, ever, ever intersect. They might be parallel and they never intersect. And so in that case, there's no answer, there's no solution. Or you might get the case where um, they're exactly the same line and they land on top of each other. And so they intersect everywhere along that line, okay? And that's called infinitely many solutions. And just to let you know, as you're working things out, when you try to change this guy to a zero, you will automatically know which of these cases you'll have, okay? So once you turn this guy into a zero, if you have a number over here, then it's going to be this case and you need to keep going, turning this number, whatever it was into a one, and then that number into a zero. However, if trying to turn this into a zero, this also becomes zero, right? Then you have one of these two cases. And in either case, you just need to look and see what's on the other side, okay? If you get zeros equal a number, that's false. That's the no solution. If you get zeros equal to zero, then that's infinitely many solutions and your answers need to look like this, okay? So it's a pretty good summary of that little paragraph. But that is the end of 5.2. I just wanted you to see what it looks like when you get a no solution or when you get an infinitely many solutions and how do you write the answer for an infinitely many solutions, okay? So I am gonna open up the floor to anyone that might have a question about about test details, about questions that are on the review, anything that you want answered before you take that test on Tuesday. Um, so I was... You went back on me, sorry. Sorry, that was an accident. But I was trying to find the review after like uh, doing some homework yesterday and I couldn't find it. Um, Okay. In my, I still was able to like, I still have a few questions anyway, uh, <laughs> after looking from notes, but yeah, I couldn't find the review. Let me try to get this little things in my way. Let me move it down. So if I go to modules, and then if we go to homework, it should be in there. But let's see. There it is, review test one. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I guess I had, a, I had a question about like the, um, I guess the- Say it again. You. 
the like unity symbol um to for yes. oh, the union uh huh union yeah um because I noticed like with the two point three um we would just be separated by a comma like for the uh my lab math stuff and I guess like when do you know to separate the two by a comma when to use a a unity or union symbol I don't know union is usually well. I'll tell you, if they say use a comma, then go ahead and use a comma. Um, if they tell you to use the union, then use the union. But what it means is basically like two pieces of interval are the entire answer for one question, okay? Whereas if you're asking me to list something, then you could use the comma because it's this, comma that, comma that, but it just depends on the, on the instructions. I, I can't click on 2.3, let me go in as a teacher so I can click on 2.3. You guys don't see all this other stuff that I have, but you're gonna see it right now. So it's gonna look weird. Um, where did it go? Assignment manager. This is the way it looks on my end, but if I get this little box out of my way, I can preview it. And I'm pretty sure there's a question in here that's gonna ask me for that. Normally, if you're doing domain and range, you usually have to include the union. But if you're doing something like increasing, decreasing a constant, they may not ask you for a union. These are not two pieces. See how it's asking me for domain and range and then they're using the union, right? Because there's two chunks of the domain or two chunks of the range. But I believe when we get to the constant, all of that, they might be using commas. We're almost getting to the end. Yeah. So when they're doing the increasing, decreasing stuff, that's the one where they tell you to use a comma. Mm -hmm. But they do explicitly say that. If it doesn't explicitly said that, I would have used the union just as well in there, okay? I guess I didn't know if it was like union with the comma, so I got one of them wrong, but uh, gotcha. no, I know like it's like the comma. Right, say, right. No, yeah, it'll be one or the other. And since they asked for the comma, then just use the comma, no union. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. That's good. And um, I guess and another question, like they're kind of small questions, but um, like like with like uh, this versus like I'm still kind of confused. Like I know you kind of explain it, but like this versus uh, like the I might type it in the chat. They're like some. You can also use the whiteboard, like watch, let me do multiple participants. And if you click on share, share screen, I think it gives you like the option to do a whiteboard. Okay. Or actually let me put a whiteboard and then can you scribble on that? No. Cannot? Okay. But I can just see. type, I can just type it because it's just one yeah. of the ones on the keyboard. Um, sure, sure, sure. So like that ahead. versus um, that, like I guess when you're talking, this is still about um, 2.3, but. Um, the brackets, mm -hmm. yeah, brackets like, means that it stops and it stops at a solid spot. So whether it's okay. a solid part of a curve or an actual solid dot, those are gonna be the times that you use the brackets. But if it's an open dot or if it's an arrow, then you would be using the parentheses, okay? okay so but that's arrow? only for that's only for domain and range, though. Okay. So if you have arrows, meaning it's going to infinity, 
Let me write out, let me show my paper. So for example, if you had a function that looked like this, and let's say that's one and this is like one, I don't know, I'm just making stuff up. Okay. Uh, let's just call this one two. Okay. If they're asking you for the domain here, you're going to be talking about X values, right? But this goes to the left forever and it goes to the right forever. So it goes to the left forever in the negative direction. And then it goes to the right forever in the positive direction. But because there's arrows there, you're going to have to use a parentheses. And I think in the lecture, I said, if you have infinity or negative infinity, you have to use the parentheses. But the range is a little bit different here because the range is the lowest spot to the highest spot, right? And the lowest spot happens to be like right there. And the reason why I drew a solid dot is because this is a solid line. It's not a dashed line, right? So because it's a solid line, it's made up of a bunch of little solid dots. I just kind of made this one stand out, okay? So the lowest Y value here is actually one, but then the highest Y value, well, it's going up forever on both sides. So it will go up to the Y value toward positive infinity. And we know that the infinities or the arrows always get parentheses, but because this actually stopped at this solid portion of the graph, this side would have a bracket. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Now that's, sense. that's different though from the increasing, decreasing and constant. So this graph is not constant anywhere, but it does increase and it does decrease. Now, when I'm tracing it from left to right, it's going downward until it gets to this spot and then it's going upward, right? So when you're doing increasing and decreasing, you're only allowed to talk about the X values. So that's what they mean when they say intervals over the domain. That means only put in X values in your intervals. Okay, so if I want to represent this half of the graph using only my x values, it would be all the way to the left x values up until this x value of two. So all the way to the left is represented by negative infinity, and we know that the infinities get the parentheses, and then it would go and stop here at two. Now you might be inclined to put a bracket there because it's solid, right? But in the increasing, decreasing, and constants, they always say the word use open intervals. And when they say open, this is open symbols and these are closed symbols. So you cannot use the bracket there, even though it's solid, it has to be an open parentheses. So that was the one thing that's different from the domain and range could have brackets, but the Increasing and decreasing and constant will never, ever, ever have brackets, ever. No matter if it's solid or not. So then even this one, if I were just to finish the problem, right? Increasing, I actually wrote it backwards, didn't I? <laughs> Put that one on the increasing. I'll just change my labels. So this one's actually decreasing. And then we'll do the increasing. So the increasing is this one because it's going up. So it starts at two and then goes up forever as I'm going to the right forever. So my X values to the right are going to positive infinity. We know that one gets a parentheses. And we also now know that when we're talking about increasing, decreasing or constant, this one will also have parentheses. And the way they say it is they say open intervals, of the domain. And so that means that all of these guys are X values and they all have parentheses. Good question. Well, so like all of the, like, they're always X, that's a, yeah, they're always X values. I mean, I put them as X values, but I didn't really know why, like, um, I right. guess. It's just because of this language, yeah. Yeah. Okay, do we have any other questions?
Does anybody know how many questions are on the test? I saw there were like 30 something on the review. Um, or maybe that wasn't, no, that was the other assignment. If I go to preview, let's see how many questions are on the review. So there are 30 on the review. The test is only like an hour, an hour and a half tops. So we're definitely not having 38 questions on the test, right? Now you, I think I have this unpublished, so you can't see it yet. I'm not gonna make it open until Tuesday. Um, and then basically the way it's gonna work is that instead of coming into class on Tuesday, you're gonna come into here and you're going to take this test, okay? It does require a lockdown browser. What the browser does, and, and I'll put, I have to put some more stuff in here. So one, I have to put in the link so that you can download the lockdown browser, okay? And then two, I'm gonna put in like a mock quiz, just a little quiz for you to click on to see if you can get into a test, okay? It's kind of like a practice. There's no questions in there. It's, and if there is a question, it's a silly question. It's nothing crazy. Um, it's just to make sure that you can open your lockdown browser, get into a test and open it and answer a question, okay? Um, but I will be putting that here. And as soon as I do, you'll have the link to download the lockdown browser. You'll have that little quick quiz to take to make sure you can access a test. And then following that will be the actual test, okay? I may even put in a practice assignment for you to practice uploading your paperwork. So with math, um, I do not view it as a all or nothing um, kind of course. So if you type in or you select an answer of five and the answer is not five, Canvas is just gonna mark you wrong, period. And it's not gonna give you any of the points for that problem. So if you turn in your paperwork, I can see where it went wrong and how wrong you were or how right you were and how much of it you actually understood. Maybe it was just some little sign error or something, okay? And then I can give you points based off of where your error was. So like if you had totally no idea, but you tried something, you might get a little bit of points. If you had a really good idea, then you probably got most of the points. And if you didn't do anything, you just guessed, then I can't give you any points if you guessed wrong, right? Um, so that's the kinds of things that I'll be looking for when I look at your paperwork. It's just what happened on that problem so I can see if I can give you extra points, okay? So so the work is more of a safety net? Yes, and, and, and okay. yeah, it will be for sure. Okay, cool. Um, but 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 you have to turn in the paperwork within 30 minutes of taking the test. So when you take the test, you click submit. And as soon as you click submit, the clock starts running. So you have 30 minutes to upload the paperwork. Now, in the paperwork thing, I will have a link to like, how do you do it? Um, I can even demonstrate for you right here, but um, it literally takes like maybe three minutes. <laughs> so 30 minutes should be plenty of time to do it. What I highly recommend though, because 30 minutes is a lot of time, do not correct your paperwork, okay? You already answered the questions on the test when you hit submit and don't change anything on your paper from that time that you click submit to the time that you submit the paperwork. Because I can tell when people change their answers, when the answers don't even match. Like what you have on a paper is completely different from what you answered in the computer, right? And I don't want your corrections. I, even if you figure out like, oh man, I did this one wrong now that I think about it, just leave it alone, okay? Just send me what you got. I'll give you points based on what you did do. But if you change it and it doesn't match, I can't give you points on that because chances are you did that after the fact. And I mean, if you're in a regular class, that doesn't happen, right? You can't take the test and then walk outside and be like, oh wait, let me fix this problem. <laughs> the test is already over, right? Um, so it's kind of like that same analogy, okay? So just leave your paperwork the way it is and just submit it, okay? Um, but this lockdown browser, what it does is it, it locks your browser down. So it's its own browser. So you know how when you normally come into class, you click on like Chrome or 
Internet Explorer, Safari, whatever it is you're clicking on to open the Internet. Um, it's its own little uh, browser. So you'll click on that and then log into ACES or Canvas and get into the class. So it's its own browser. And what it does is it disables everything else in your computer. So when you're in that browser, you can only be in that browser and you can't open up other tabs of other browsers. You can't open up other tabs in that browser. Um, so once you start that test, it like locks it all down, okay? Um, and that's just to prevent people from Googling things and stuff like that while they're trying to be taking a test, okay? Um, the second thing that it does is it does record you, okay? And that's for test security purposes so that I can make sure that nobody's using bracket calculators, nobody's getting help from their friends in the background, you know, things like that, right? Um, if you do have small children, I always get the question because like in the instructions, it says no one can be in the room. I mean, if the kid don't know how to do, ca do ca college algebra, then <laughs> I have no problem with the baby being in the room, right? Um, but if it's like a whole adult person that's in your room that might know uh, college algebra, then that's not what's allowed, right? Um, but it does record you and I have to review. And so in the instructions, it says something like clothes is important, please wear clothes. I have had people <laughs> take their tests and not have fully clothes. Um, so just keep that in mind that I do have to watch. Um, so don't do anything or wear anything that you don't want me to see, okay? Um, but it does record you. And so that's just for test security. When you do the recording, it will ask you for an ID and that's just to verify um, identity. So you can use either the school ID, you could use your state ID, you could use your driver's license, you could use a government um, ID, like for the military, um, anything that has basically your picture and your name on it. And you don't even need, you could put a post-it note on your address and everything else like that if you want to for, for privacy, okay? I just need to see your picture and then your name, okay? Um, other than that, Let's see how many, it says it's 100 points, but it doesn't tell me um, how many questions there. If you click on it, you should see the same thing, okay? So it does have 20 questions. Most of them are quick. They're not like long, lengthy ones, okay? Um, so even though it sounds like a lot, 20, it, it, you should be able to do those 20. Now, I don't remember if I put a time limit, because there should be. It says 50 minutes, but that's not a whole class period. So I'm actually going to edit that. Our classes are 75 minutes, actually. So I will change this to 75 minutes. I think that was for one of the like old classes that were only like an hour long. Um, but I'll change that to 75 minutes. And then it just says, um, what does it say here? I don't even remember what I write. All the tests are different. <laughs> So you must show your work and problem if you want to receive the full or partial credit, um, except for problems 9 through 12, because those, I think, I think they're like five problems, 9, 10, 11, 12. There's only 9, 10, 11, 12. Yeah, five. They're graphs. So you just look at the graph, and then you answer. There's really nothing you can write down. Um, so those, you don't have to show anything at all, OK? Um, oh, see, I'm going to have to change, yeah. No, I'm going to leave this language in there. I do need you to show your work for each problem. Um, and the reason why, and I'll explain, is because a lot of students do things backwards on a multiple choice test. So if the problem says solve for X, and all you do is take all the numbers that are on the choices and plug them in, you didn't solve for X, did you? You just check the answers, right? That's not following the direction. That's not showing me that you know how to solve for X, okay? And so that's not okay. And so that's why I think that those directions are in there is because you're trying to avoid that from happening, okay? I will tell you, I am pretty lenient on that. If you answer the question correct, I'm trying to look, I'm trying to look more to see if I can give you bonus points, but I know my department has their own standards. And so they do want to see you try to explain something for each one, okay? Show me something. <laughs> um, and then make sure you do them in order because I have to look at them later and I don't want to have like, number one and 10 on page one and number two and 16 on another page, right? It gets real confusing when I'm trying to go through and grade. So do try to do them in order. If you have to like skip around, just leave a little bit of space. Um, it says at least half a page. I don't think any of our problems are that long that we're gonna have to have a whole half a page, but just leave a good chunk of space so that 
you can come back to it later. Um, and then do as much work as you can. Try to, um, I try to tell people, don't think of your paperwork as your scratch paper. Because if you do that, chances are it's gonna be ugly. It's gonna be messy, scribbles all over the place, and I won't be able to tell what I'm reading. Okay, really try to write like number one, do some stuff, number two, do some stuff and so forth, okay? Um, and then it says you can circle or box your final answer except for those problems because they're just visual. You're just gonna look, okay? And then make sure you do um, click on an answer from the multiple choices, okay? When you click that answer, and then I see your paperwork and they match, then I know you did that problem while you were taking the test and it didn't happen afterward, okay? So that's kind of what locks you in and like, I did this test during test time, okay? Um, and then submit the test when you're done and make sure that you've chosen all your multiple choice answers. It sometimes does give you a reminder. So like if there's one that you didn't, you didn't answer, it'll tell you, are you sure do you want to submit the test? You didn't answer anything for number seven. And then you can go back and look at your paper and then make sure you click something for number seven. Um, there is a password, it's always on highlight. I always get people asking me, what's the password? You didn't read, <laughs> you just hold on yourself. Um, but there is a password in there, okay? Um, and so they are, I think about five points each. So even those visual ones, those are gonna be nice, but the visual ones are nice because they're easy and you don't have anything to write, right? But the horrible thing about the visual ones is that if you answer it wrong, you really can't get the partial credit on that unless somehow you explained what you were seeing and how you got that answer on the paper. But I'm not expecting you to do that, okay? But those are, they're nice because they're very visual. You don't have to do anything, but at the same time, it's like a, you know, it's a one and done. Either you get it or you don't, okay? Um, now let's go to that review. I thought I had opened it. Maybe I did. There it is. So they kind of are all over the place. It's going from the very beginning of factoring, which will come back when we get to the next uh, unit, right? So all these assignments were grouped as one unit. And then the next unit, the next group of um, problems, you'll have to uh, work on those and you will need factoring. So like solving this equation, it says to do it by factoring. I know y'all know quadratic formula now, but if the instruction said to do it by factoring, if you want the extra partial credit for getting it wrong, it has to be done by factoring. Okay. Definitely. I, I mean, I can't tell you enough. Don't try to avoid the factoring. It's going to be throughout the whole semester. So please, please, please practice the factoring. This one says use the square root property. So make sure that you're using that square root property. Because I think there's one of each of those in there. I know for sure that there's one. There's one that says do it by factoring. There's one that says do it by the square root property. And there's one that says do it by the quadratic formula. And then there might be another one that just says solve and you pick whatever way you want to do it. So it's taking us way back. Um, let's keep going. There are, I, I know that there's a fraction one in there, like what it looks like exactly, I can't say, but I know for sure there's a, fa a fraction one in there. So remember to multiply your two denominators together and then multiply every term by that denominator. If you have to go look back at the notes, please do, right? Um, another question I got, I think I answered it the last class, but I'm not sure. But somebody in the class asked me if you could use notes on the test. And for our class, it is open notes, okay? So you can use all of your notes or just some of them or a summary of your notes, whatever you want. Um, just no graphing calculators. That's essentially the biggest thing, okay? And then they can't Google things or I don't even know what the new websites are, but there's websites where you can basically take a picture of the problem and then it does it for you. Um, but you definitely can't have your, your cell phones or another laptop or computer around while you're testing or a graphing calculator. That's basically what I'm looking at in the video is just to make sure you're not using any of those three devices. Um, so good, there's a couple of them with fractions for you to practice. 
there will be one with the radical. So I think there's probably a couple of them in here with radicals. Yep, but there will be one with the radical. We just threw in a few so that you could kind of get to practicing them, okay? These problems on the review are similar to the ones on the test. There's just not as many questions because here I might give you three versions of one kind of problem, but you're only gonna get one of them on the test, okay? So if you're doing the review and you're writing out all your solutions real nice and elaborate, that should be very helpful when you get to the actual test, okay? I know this is on the final. I meant it's probably not the same numbers like the eight and the 20 and the negatives, but I know that that problem's on the final. I cannot remember if it's on this test, but I know it's on the final. So you definitely want to remember this problem, number 19, okay? And of course, there's another one just to practice it, right? And then domain and range, we kind of kind of touched on that, but there will be some, not, not a lot, but there will be a problem, at least one, that talks about domain and range, okay? Um, and there will probably be one that asks you, is it even a function, right? Is this one a function? There's a test that we do to decide whether it's a function. It's that vertical line test, right? And if I draw a vertical line and it touches it more than one time, then it's not a function. So if I were to draw, maybe say right here where the two is at, where X is two, if I were to draw a vertical line there, it would touch it up top and down below. And so that cost it twice, which means this is not a function. Whereas like this one is, because it doesn't matter what vertical line I draw, each vertical line only touches the graph one time, right? If you look at this vertical line at negative one, it only touches it one time. If I look at the vertical line at two, it only touches the blue, the blue graph one time. So that one would be a function. I can't, there are some problems that ask you for domain and range. I can't remember if it's one or two of them. And most likely it's either gonna be a radical or a fraction or a combination of the two. I just can't remember exactly. See, there's a fraction where they're asking in domain and range and another fraction. Well, they don't give you combos. So there probably isn't a combo on the test. It's probably just one with a radical and one with a fraction. These are nice and easy, right? You're just plugging in the numbers. That is possibly a problem on the test. Not multiples of them, but this one is. I do remember a problem like this, okay? Where they're gonna give you a graph and then they're gonna ask you for something like this, okay? And for these, you're basically, you are given the X value in the parentheses and your job is to find the Y value that goes with it, right? So for instance, I'm gonna do this one, B, F of six. So that means that my X value is six, which is over here. And what they wanna know is what's the Y value. So you basically just go up to where the graph is at and then whatever that Y value is, that's the answer, okay? So in this case, it would happen to also be six. X was the value they gave me was six and the Y value also happened to be six. But I do remember there being a graph like that. Not that same shape maybe, but a graph. And then you had to say, answer the questions. There is definitely going to be one problem with increasing, decreasing and constant. So it'll give you a picture. And then you have to say all the intervals. But remember these words, right? Open intervals. Okay, so open intervals means they have to have parentheses. And I think I even specifically say over the domain so that you remember your X values in those um, intervals. I think that one's increasing, decreasing as well, just a different picture. I can't remember how many of the matrices there are, but I know there's a problem like this on the final exam. 
where they give you the matrix and they just want you to do some kind of operation. And then you have to tell them what the answer looks like, the new matrix. What is the new matrix going to look like? Okay, this one kind of does half of it for you because they already like let you know that you're replacing row two, right? The augmented matrix, remember I've been using that word all day, right? So just put the numbers where they belong. There's most likely one like that on the test because I know there's one like that on the final, which is okay by me because those are pretty easy, right? And then of course, there's most likely gonna be one where you have to solve, okay? Now this one though, if you're doing it in the review, it's not ready to go into an augmented matrix yet. So make sure you move your constants over before you try to put it in the augmented matrix. There's another one to solve. And I'm pretty sure that I gave you one of each kind. So when you do the review, at least one of them should have an answer and one of them should have um, no solution and one of them should be um, infinitely many solutions. Just because if I give you one on the test, you don't know which one it's gonna be, right? You don't know which kind of answer it's gonna have. So if you practice all three kinds and you have all three as examples, then it should help you when you do um, the test. And then 37 and 38 are actually word problems. And so I didn't actually get to the word problem. I forgot all about it actually. <laughs> so I'm gonna do one of the word problems. And y'all can pick, do you want me to do 37 or 38? It does not matter. 37. 37, okay. So 37 says a waitress sold, um, she sold 20 ribeye steaks, steak dinners. I'm just writing the info, I'm not writing the whole paragraph. Um, and four grilled salmon dinners. So 14 salmon dinners. Um, totaling this dollar amount, 599.64. My six looks weird, but it's okay. Then the second situation, the next sentence says, on another day, she sold 22 steak dinners. And then she sold seven salmon dinners. And that came out to be 584.55. So the question is, how much did each type of dinner cost? Okay, and this is round to the nearest hundredth, only because dollars and cents are in one hundredths, right? So let me move back to my paper. I just wrote down the info. I did not write the paragraph. I just wrote the info from the first sentence, totaling this with my weird six. And then um, this information totaling that dollar amount, okay? So what we have to do is we have to, um, we have to basically come up with our letters. Normally we like the X and Y, right? So you have to pick. Alphabetically, X comes before Y. And in both of those sentences, steak dinners came before salmon dinners. So just out of my own intuition, <laughs> I wanna say let X equal the cost of the steak dinners. And then Y would equal the cost of the salmon dinners. Okay, and so what you, end up having to do is basically taking that first chunk of information in the first sentence and turn it into an equation and then take the second chunk of information given in the second sentence into its equation. And once you have those two equations, you can just solve the system, okay? Um, so for us, if we're buying 20 steak dinners, isn't it gonna cost me $20 for e or it's gonna cost me this price times 20 because I'm purchasing 20 of those dinners, right? So each one of these 20 dinners is gonna be at the price of whatever 
for the steak dinner's cost, okay? But when you're adding up stuff, right, your bill, you're gonna add them up. Now I have 14 salmon dinners that are gonna cost this amount of money. I don't know what that amount of money is. I just know that I have to multiply the two in order to get all the cost of the 14 salmon dinners. And I do know that whatever this cost is, gives me that total cost. Whatever this cost gives, gives me the salmon total cost. And if I add the two costs, the two total costs together, I get the, the bill, right? The total bill, which in this case ended up being 599.64. Then similarly, for the other bit of information, these are the steak dinners. So each one of these 22 dinners cost X amount of dollars. These seven salmon dinners cost Y dollars. And I know that at the end, the total total bill is supposed to be 584.55. And so if I go and I put this in my matrix form, this is gonna be really weird with these big numbers, but it's okay. So chances are there's going to be a word problem on the test, just I don't know which one it's gonna be, what the scenario is gonna be. <clears throat> so then first goal is to actually turn this one into a one. In order for me to do that, I have to multiply by the reciprocal, right? 20 is the same thing as 20 over one. So it's reciprocal is going to be one over 20. So I'm gonna to have to do one over 20 times row one to get me my new row one with that one in that spot where the box is at, right? So let's see, one over 20 times 20 is just one. One over 20 times 14, I got in my calculator this, but if I hit the double arrow for the decimal, it is a nice decimal. It doesn't keep going and going and going. So I am just gonna use the decimal, 0 0.7. If it wasn't such a nice decimal, I would have had to have used the fractions, okay? But it's nice. What about one over 20 times that guy, 599.64? This is also a nice decimal. It's not as nice as 0.7, but it does stop. So I am allowed to type it in here. The bottom row is not changing right now. We're only worried about that top row. So I'm just gonna rewrite all of this stuff the way it was. Then the next goal is to turn this guy to a zero. And we know that in order to do that, we have to use opposite, same number, but the opposite sign. And we don't wanna multiply by row two because we wanna replace row two so that the zero could be right there. So we have to actually multiply it by row one. And then when we add row two, that allows us to replace row two. Now that one I do have to do some work on the side. So this would be negative 22, negative 22 times 0.7 negative 15.4 and negative 22 times that 29.982 is this weird number. 659.604. Now the bottom row is just gonna get added at the bottom. So negative 22 plus 22 is gonna give me zero. Um, negative 15.4 plus seven is negative 8.4. And negative 659.604 plus 584.55. I get this number. And so that is going to replace my row two, right? Row two is gonna become this thing. So 
So row one is not changing, it's staying exactly as it was, and row two is becoming this. Then as we continue that U shape, right? One, zero, one, zero. This one needs to go into a one. And so to do that, we're gonna multiply by one over negative 8.4. And we wanna multiply it by row two so that we can change our row two. There's no extra row involved. So the first one will stay the same. Zero times anything is still going to be zero. This number times its reciprocal is going to be one. But the other one, I don't know. One over eight, negative 8.4 times negative 75.054. I get 8.935. And then finally, we can do the last one, this one. We want to turn it into a zero. So we have to use the opposite. We're going to use 0 0.7, but the opposite. And we need to multiply it by row two. So we can add row one, meaning we're going to replace row one. So when I multiply row two, I'm going to get zero, negative 0 0.7. negative 6.2545, and then row one. Oh no, I multiplied, oh yeah, I did it right. I did this number. So that times one over negative 8.4, this times one over negative 8.4, and this times one over negative 8.4. I don't think I did that one right though. Nope, I did not. I knew something was weird. Now this one does not give me a nice number. Look at the number right there. But when I hit double arrow, it won't change it. So I'm just gonna write the whole number as many digits as I can. So that when I round it at the very end, it'll still round correctly. If I chop it too soon, it might be off a significant digit, okay? So just leave the decimals and then round at the very, very, very end. Now row one is gonna go right underneath all of that. So one, 0 0.7 and 29.982. So one and zero when I add is one. When I add these, I get zero. And when I add those, We get two eight point nine one eight three zero nine five two. So here's my matrix. One zero, and I'm gonna round this now. Twenty eight point ninety two. There's my cent, and this is gonna make that cent go up to ninety two cents. Now row two is zero, one, and 8.9. This is my sense, and that five does make it go up. So remember, this first column is X. So one X equals that number, and one Y equals this number. So when I go to type my answers in, make sure that you remember what your X represented. That's why I always like to write this step down so that when I have my X and my Y, I can go back up to the top and be like, oh, which one was X and which one was Y, okay? So apparently the steak dinners cost $28.92, but the salmon dinners cost $8.94.
And I think the one in the homework was something like this problem. Let me just scoot this up a little bit. It was something about a contractor with day laborers and concrete finishers and all kinds of weird stuff in the payroll. Um, that one is pretty much the same kind of setup though. So you would just let X equal to solve, find the daily wages. So X equals the labor wage and then concrete finisher. So Y would equal the concrete finisher wage. Okay, so when you read the first sentence, it's saying five day laborers cost this amount of much each plus one concrete finisher costing that much per person. And the total cost was 960. Then the second sentence tells you if he hires one day laborer with the day labor rate plus four concrete finishers at the concrete finisher rate, that should equal a total cost of 838. And then you go through the same steps, right? You set up your matrix and you solve the whole thing until you figure out what X is and what Y is. And then when you do have those numbers, just remember which one represented what, okay? But usually your first sentence gives you the whole first equation. And then your second sentence gives you the whole second equation. I will say that a lot of the problems that are on this test, not all of them, because there's not that many questions on the final, but there are the questions that you see on this review, some of them are going to be questions that are on the final. So you will see them again. And I like to do that. I like to make sure we've done them in class. You see them on the review again. You'll see them on the test again. So at least I know you've seen it at least three times before you actually see it on the final exam, okay? And I, I think the final exam does have a word problem like this. I think. I could have sworn it does. They keep changing it, but they don't change it too much. Like the problems are still kind of the same kind of problems. It's just they might change the scenario or the numbers. It's still a word problem that make, that uses matrices. Are there any other questions? I know we're running out of time. We have about six minutes left, but are there any other um, questions? So remember it is open notes, just no cell phones, no other laptops or computers around. I mean, if it's there, just make sure it's covered or something, then you're not going over there to go get it. Um, and no graphing calculators. Make sure you do have a scientific calculator. I actually do enable a scientific calculator inside the test in that lockdown browser. So if you don't have one, there will be a little icon at the top and you can use a calculator in there, okay? So keep a lookout, I'm going to post the video and then I'm going to post the notes for later today. I'm also going to add those, um, the lockdown browser link so you can download it. And then that little uh, quick quiz to see if it works, if you figured it out. Um, and then I'm also gonna add a upload assignment just so you can practice uploading. When you do practice your uploading, practice taking pictures of multiple pages and turning it into one file only, not multiple files, okay? That's the part that you gotta practice. I do give you um, a video link on an app called Camp Scanner on your phone. So once you click submit on the test, go grab your cell phone, take photos of it using that Camp Scanner app with the directions, and you should be able to send it just fine. Okay. But I will have all those directions inside that assignment for the practice. And it's the same directions on the actual test paper submission assignment. Well, if you think of anything else as you're working on this and getting ready for the test on Tuesday, you can always text message me or email me, right? I will respond faster by text, but you're more than welcome to email me as well. 
Um, I usually just don't respond to emails unless it's Monday through Friday during like work time. So if you email me on Friday night, if you're probably not going to get a response until Monday morning. So definitely text me if you're needing help beyond Friday night. Okay. Um, other than that, you guys, I wish you a good weekend. I hope you study. I wish you all the best on this test. We will not be logging in for class. You will just be taking the test. Okay. But have a good weekend and I will see you physically see you on um, Thursday, next Thursday. Have a good weekend. You too. Have a good one. Alrighty. Bye, Miss. Thank you. Bye bye.